So yeah, I think this is a great, great initiative. And I hope that as we were talking with you guys now, um, I hope once, um, once things open up, we can have more of these events live. Um, do you, can you see my slides? If you can just give me the thumbs up. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so, so the inspiration for this talk is um, kind of increasing doubts that I'm hearing, at least in my part of the world, um, about the helpfulness of theorizing epistemic decolonization. And, and my suspicion is that suspicion is rather that if we give in to these doubts, uh, we're kind of going to derail the, the, the epistemic decolonization project before uh, it's, we've attained the goals that we, uh, we're presumably fighting for. Um, and that's going to be rather convenient to, to the powers that be, um, I feel. Uh, not to mention that it's going to also derail this, uh, this series across four continents. So, so the aim of, of, of the talk is to develop a conception of epistemic decolonization that's geared to withstanding such doubts. Um, and in particular, I'm going to do so in the contemporary African context. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to engage one author that to my mind at least most compellingly spells out these doubts. Um, and that's Bernard Mutolino um, uh, in, uh, from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, um, in a piece that, that he published last year in, in a special issue that I edited on uh, epistemic decolonization. So the plan is I'm going to spell out his challenges, or at least the core challenges as I see them, uh, that Bernard Mutolino poses to the project. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on, on three of them. Uh, and then from those I'll extract uh, kind of desiderata for a good theory on epistemic decolonization, uh, at least for, for my African context. Um, and and um, uh, hopefully that kind of conception of epistemic decolonization is going to withstand uh, not just Matulino's challenges, but a broader uh, skepticism about the decolonization project. Um, let me just, sorry about this, let me just time this so that I don't um, overstay my welcome. Um, so um, let me just clarify a couple of things. So Matulino is not denying uh, that uh, colonialism, slavery, all of these horrible things were horrible things. Right? Um, and he's also not denying the need to decolonize, um, nor is he denying our rights to epistemic decolonization. Um, and by this, uh, by epistemic decolonization, he means a process that's aimed to quote him at restoring the humanity of victims of colonization, as well as asserting their standing as people capable of full exercise of rational authority. So he's not denying any of these obvious things, right? Or any of the, the fundamental uh, uh, assumptions uh, behind epistemic decolon the, the epistemic decolonization debate. What he is denying, um, or at least questioning, uh, as, as, as he, put it, he puts it, uh, uh, more diplomatically, is the relevance, and this is again a quote from him, the relevance, use, and continuation of deco deco decoloniality as a genre of thought and practice on the African continent against the background of perennial problems uh, of material underdevelopment and stifled political spaces that render the supposed beneficiaries of decolonization hopeless subjects, uh, which continue to, to, sorry about this, I can't actually see how to this, who continue to be disempowered uh, uh, and oppressed in their own home. Um, so, so, so this is, uh, as far as I can see, the core of the challenge uh, that, that, that he poses uh, to, to theorizing epistemic decolonization rather than the project itself. Now, I take um, his argument to go something like this, and this is my, my formalization. Um, Firstly, decolonization of any kind, he tells us, is a political project. But so then it would follow that um, epistemic decolonization is a political project. Um, but he says for a political project not to be pointless or to be of any kind of uh, theoretical use or any kind of use, it needs to actually deliver political results, the kinds of results that it's aiming at, such as empowerment, justice, uh, the liberation from oppression and so on. Uh, but, and here's the, the crux, he says, theorizing epistemic decolonization doesn't deliver 
and sometimes even undermines such results in Africa. Uh, and so theorizing epistemic decolonization is pointless in Africa. Um, let me just briefly, well, show you that, that he actually says these things. Uh, so the, the, the formalization is mine, but that he, you know, he says uh, uh, various things around, in, in the course of the paper that, that actually uh, really has these premises there. So, um, so the first premise, uh, he, says, uh, he says this, decolonization in essence is a political project. We must think of decolonization either as emerging from politics or as politics or as addressing the political. In its formulation, sorry, in its formulation as a response to the colonial experience, it seeks to take over control of the political space by replacing the foreign determinants with local forces. So that's what he says um, on the political nature uh, of decolonization. Now, second premise obviously is entailed by the first. So if, if all decolon decolonization uh, is a political project, then so is epistemic decolonization. But um, again, let me use his words on this one uh, to make sure that uh, all is fair. So he says, in this sense, everything about decolonization is political, including its epistemology. Epistemic decolonization then must be seen as a political commitment to ridding the formerly colonized space of the epistemological effects of colonization's frames uh, of understanding and interpreting reality. Um, okay, so epistemic decolonization is a political project. Um, thirdly, uh, this is an assumption that he has to make for the argument to go through. So for a political project not to be pointless, it has to deliver political results. Um, otherwise it will be mysterious uh, why not delivering these results is a problem. Um, and finally, and this is the most important premise to my mind, and one that I'll be spending a lot of time in this talk on, um, uh, I already gestured at it. Uh, so uh, in the previous quote, and the, sorry, in the first quote that I gave you, uh, as he said, the, the supposed beneficiaries of decolonization uh, are hopeless subjects who continue to be disempowered uh, and oppressed in their own home. So, that's what I take uh, to, to, to indicate that, that he thinks that theorizing epistemic decolonization does not deliver the sorts of political results it's meant to deliver. Um, and a final word on the, on the conclusion, I think it's probably saying that it's pointless in Africa is kind of formulating it quite stridently uh, and I'm doing so deliberately in order to have the kind of strongest uh, the, or the, the most striking version of the challenge. Uh, but if you don't like, if you think that uh, Matulino's argument is more friendly to theorizing epistemic decolonization, replace this with uh, some elegant term like of doubtful value or usefulness or whatever. Um, nothing, nothing in my argument is going to turn on this. So I, I'm not particularly hung up on how we, how we spell out the conclusion. Now, I have some worries about the argument and I want to, uh, and it's kind of about the formal aspects of the argument. And I want to briefly mention them, um, uh, not so briefly mention them actually, in case you're having them as well. And I'm going to do so only to set them aside because I think that at the end of the day, uh, well, apart from the fact that um, I edited the special issue, so it's going to be embarrassing if, if the, the argument has formal problems, uh, but I'm going to really set them aside because I think they missed the point of Matulino's challenge. Um, and, and, and it still stands, even if they're formal worries about the argument. So that said, let me tell you what these worries are. So I think that the first one is a rather crucial one. I think that this argument is in fact invalid uh, as it is. Uh, and the problem is that uh, premises one and two are about decolonization and epistemic decolonization themselves, um, whereas premises four and five are about theorizing epistemic, sorry, premise four and the conclusion are about theorizing epistemic decolonization um, and theorizing the epistemic decolonization being pointless. So in other words, what's required uh, by, by one and two to deliver results is the project of epistemic decolonization itself, uh, but what is concluded to be not viable is theorizing uh, epistemic decolonization. Now you might think, okay, well, uh, remember that I, I've actually formalized this argument, so perhaps I did a shoddy job, uh, but, but I think that you can't make this argument both valid and sound at the same time. So if you, um, if you add theorizing in, in, the first, in, uh, in the first, second, and third premises, you're going to render them false. 
So um, one and two become false. So theorizing decolonization of any kind uh, can be any kind of project. It's not necessarily a political project, right? It can be a historical project. We can be uh, theorizing decolonization with the aim of getting our facts straight or something like this. Uh, or it can be an anthropological project and hopefully it can be a philosophical project, otherwise we're, we're wasting our time here. Um, and uh, so, of course, is a theorizing epistemic decolonization. It needn't be a political project itself. Um, and likewise, if you add theorizing to, to the third premise, uh, it doesn't seem plausible. So uh, for theorizing a political project not to be pointless, the theorization needs to deliver political results. Mm, no, okay. So it, it would be very nice if this theorization delivers, I don't know, clarity or historical accuracy or whatever your purpose is. It doesn't need to deliver political uh, results. So if you want to see this as a dilemma, so that's one way of fixing the argument, the validity of the argument, but it, it, it's still unsound. Um, on the other hand, if you drop threatening uh, from, sorry, theorizing from, uh, from premise four and from the conclusion, they become false. So it's just not true that uh, epistemic decolonization itself doesn't deliver uh, or undermines uh, empowerment and justice and so on. <clears throat> um, uh, because clear, clearly successful decolonization would be a precondition for empowerment um, and justice and, and so on. And, and likewise, the conclusion, uh, uh, epistemic decolonization can be pointless in Africa. I mean, we're still very much uh, a colonial uh, country, despite what some people uh, would like to believe. Okay, so we can't make the argument uh, valid and sound. So that's the second worry about it. Um, the third worry is that it has a kind of odd, and I, maybe you can help me in the discussion, but it's, it's a kind of odd self-undermining air about it, right? So, so the argument itself is, is an example of theorizing epistemic decolonization, to my mind. And moreover, I don't think that it's a pointless kind of theorization of epistemic decolonization, because that kind of argument that sets con practical constraints on, on, on these political projects uh, is actually quite useful, you know, it, it moves us on in, in fruitful directions. Um, and moreover, it, it kind of, it just begs for such theorizing, right? Epistem theorizing of epistemic decolonization, because the kind of challenge that it issues must be partly answered by further theorizing, right? So you can't really answer the, 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 the challenge with going like, well, look, here, look at my country, right? It's like, right, you need to, uh, work out what, what kind of conception of epistemic decolonization it presupposes and so on. So it's, it's kind of begging for more uh, epistemic decolonize, uh, uh, decolonization theorizing. And if we answer it successfully, we'll boost the credentials of theorizing such uh, decolonization by producing a better conception of epistemic decolonization. So this is, this is why I'm getting the sense that like, it's just something weirdly under, set on the mind of the argument. Um, but as I said to begin with, uh, I fine. Okay, I, I don't think we should we should be too faced about these these issues. Um, and the problem is that even if they're formally correct, right, they kind of completely miss the, the significance of Montalini's challenge. So I think we just if we if we let them run down the argument at this stage or his his challenge at this stage, uh, we're going to cheat ourselves of an opportunity to take seriously what it takes for, for a viable conception of epistemic decolonization uh, to be theorized. Uh, and the reason is that, look, I mean, if premise four is true, right? So if theorizing epistemic decolonization doesn't deliver uh, results such as empowerment, justice, and so on, well, what the hell are we doing, right? So like, why would we care about theorizing if it doesn't uh, indeed deliver such results? So it doesn't matter what kind of argument this premise is embedded in, uh, if we grant that premise, then, then the whole uh, epistemic decolonization project is, is kind of undermined in deep ways. And so this is what I'm going to focus my attention on from, from now on for the rest of the talk, this premise. Um, and Matulino develops uh, various sophisticated and, and, and elaborate reasons for, for this premise, uh, but I'm going to just focus on three of them. And I'll, I'll put them in, in the form of a challenge, uh, of three challenges, sorry. Uh, and the first one is that epistemic decolonization leaves the African person kind of forever stuck in a negative uh, uh, project of identifying herself against or in relation to the colonizer. 
Um, the second one is that it politicizes, illegitimately politicizes uh, the knowledge enterprise. Uh, and finally, the third one is that it, it obscures important aspects of the African person's condition uh, that, uh, uh, such as, for example, her own complicity in, in the corruption and poverty and, and, and other uh, conditions of, of the African uh, continent. So these are going to be the three challenges that I'm going to be um, uh, looking at. And in each case, I'm going to draw some morals from, from these challenges uh, in, in order to develop a better conception uh, or a more Matulino-proof conception of epistemic decolonization. So the first challenge, um, here, here it is in his own words, um, he says, continued theorization on, on decolonial lines is testimony to the importance of colonialism to the shaping of our experiences as selves. What the real story has to be is how far the shaping of our experience actually extends in the constitution of who we are. Is it all encompassing, negligible or crucial? My suggestion is that emphasis on decolonial, uh, sorry, emphasis on decolonial reflection and usage of decolonial frameworks actually begins to contribute towards neglecting, taking seriously our other senses of who we are and how we've come to be uh, what we are. So I'm going to just put it uh, as, a, as, a, as a simple um, one-liner that continued uh, epistemic decolonization the theorizing leaves the African person forever stuck uh, in defining herself in relation to the colonizer and to her colonial past. Uh, what's the problem with this? Um, let me spell it out a bit. These, these are bits that I'm picking up from, from Matulino's paper uh, 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 as a whole. Um, I think that, that the two, two groups of costs or harms uh, that go with this kind of definition of the self against, against the colonial past. Um, and he doesn't discuss all of these ethical costs, but he gestures at some of them in, uh, at, at any rate. So the, fir the first cost is that you're failing to cultivate uh, your positive African identity because you're forever, uh, you've, you're really forever fixated uh, on defining yourself against the colonizer. You're failing to cultivate the positive bits of your African identity. Um, and this is something that he doesn't discuss, but we could add uh, uh, the, the, the moral from, from Du Bois uh, that you would be then stuck in a kind of double consciousness world, right? Where uh, where you're know, finding an authentic self, where you're always looking at yourself through the gaze of the colonizer. Um, and, and so authenticity becomes impossible for, for one. Um, uh, and again, this is not something that, that Matulino discusses, but again, we can say, well, uh, you know, given the, given the frameworks of the, the broader debate, um, uh, this kind of definition of yourself against the colonizer would perpetuate white normativity, right? So we, 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 we're putting the colonizer at the center of our world, right? I mean, this is the standard, and this is the guy that we're going to be looking for and at, right, uh, for guidance. So, so these are the, the, the broadly speaking ethical costs uh, of, of, uh, of uh, defining oneself against the colonizer. Um, but the theoretical costs, and here Matulino is more explicit, uh, is, well, the first one is that it obscures portion, portions of reality, right? So if um, clearly an African person is not just about uh, 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 the, an anti-colonial kind of stance, right? Uh, and most importantly, from Atulino's argument, uh, such a, such a self-definition in negative terms would undermine uh, the aim of epistemic decolonization, right? Because the whole point of epistemic decolonization is to get rid of this colonial center, right? Uh, so so um, uh, both of one's framework uh, and, and in one's politics and society and so on. So if you recall, um, uh, what we're trying to do through these challenges is support that core premise, the fourth premise of the argument. And that said that epistemic uh, decolonization theorizing uh, is not conducive to and often undermines political results. So if you're undermining uh, the aim of epistemic decolonization, then, then, you, uh, then you're not doing very well uh, with the project of decolonization. So this is the, so this is the challenge as I take it. So it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's got pretty hectic implications if that's indeed the case. And my, my, my reply to this challenge is going to be that, okay, it, it, 
it works for certain conceptions of epistemic decolonization, but not for others. So um, in particular, uh, if you recall last week's conversation between, between uh, Professor Smith and Andreas, uh, uh, and, and it was done in terms of writing back versus writing to the powers that be. Uh, and, uh, and I take it that this, this was really uh, a conversation uh, that pretty much maps onto the distinction that Lugonis draws between vertical practices of resistance and horizontal practices of resistance. So to put it simply, uh, uh, for those of us who were there, sorry Andreas for identifying you with the, with the, with the bit that actually, not that Andreas was endorsing this, uh, this, this model, uh, but uh, to put it in, in terms of last, what happened last week, um, the challenge, the first challenge of Matulina's works for the sort of vertical writing back conception of, of decolonization, uh, and it does not work for the uh, horizontal writing to conception of, of, um, of epistemic decolonization. But let me move it to, to my African context. So, um, so in, in, in African terms, uh, this is Kwasi Uredu who distinguishes between a negative and a positive program to epistemic decolonization. Uh, and so in, in those terms, the challenge does seem to work uh, for the negative program. So here is uh, Weredu's own uh, uh, notion of that program, and he thinks of it as the elimination uh, of modes of conceptualization that came to us through colonization and remain in our thinking owing to inertia rather than to our own reflective choices. Um, a little bit closer to, to my home, at least, this is Ashil Mbembe from the University of the Vizpatisrand. He thinks of it, of the negative program, uh, as rejecting the assumption that the modern West is the central root of Africa's consciousness and cultural heritage. Um, so this is the African version. Uh, but of course, we see the same, the same thing. Uh, sorry, not of course. Um, uh, the same thing. Uh, uh, happening, pretty much the same thing happening with Mignolo's notion of epistemic disobedience, uh, which is understood as a kind of rejection of, of what he calls the zero point. Um, and that's simply the, the kind of uh, colonial universalist conception of knowledge that, that revolves around the disembodied, dislocated subject that's supposed to, supposedly objective and neutral, uh, but in fact simply um, uh, reflects the, the geo-socio-political location of the global north. So I think that the challenge does work for, for this kind of negative. If you think that epistemic, if this is all there is, as far as you're concerned, to epistemic decolonization, then I think that you, you're vulnerable to, to Matulino's first challenge. Uh, but most people don't think of epistemic decolonization in these terms. So Wiredu himself thinks that there's also a positive program involved. So that's that's the program of, of uh, exploiting, as in his words, as much as is judicious, the resources of our own indigenous conceptual schemes. Um, and um, uh, another theorist, I think also Shio Mbembe talks about recentering, but this is uh, Sabelin Lovigicheni, who also thinks of the decolonial project as one of epistemic recentering. So, um, uh, what, so he, he puts it this way, an intellectual and academic process of centering Africa as a legitimate historical unit of analysis in epistemic site from which to interpret the world, while at the same time globalizing knowledge from Africa. Um, and so this is again the African context, uh, but uh, last week we also saw uh, in, in another one of the conversations, uh, notice that I'm putting continents, right? It's the four continent series. So, uh, so I've, I've, had, I've had South America and Africa, and now I've got New Zealand. And you have to wait for the fourth one with bated breath. So, so last week, uh, the same kind of uh, positive program was, was referred to uh, uh, by Linda Smith with what we're trying to create rather than what we're trying to, uh, to, to uh, reject. Uh, and she referred to recentering as decentering. I think I still think that the recentering is better because it's not as negative as decentering, but, but it doesn't matter, right? Whatever you want to call it, the point is that here's positive work uh, that doesn't is not um, uh, liable to Matulina's challenge. So, so by recentering, so in other words, we mean something like uh, reclaiming our right and our ability to think and theorize from our own geographic and sociocultural location, uh, which, which means that it's going to be 
uh, our theorizing and our, our epistemic enterprises are going to revolve our, our, on, around our own epistemic endeavors, so our, our own interests, which stem from those geographical uh, locations. Um, and uh, they're going to be employing our own conceptual schemes, and they're going to concern our own social identities. Uh, and the interests that go with us. Um, and moreover, um, this, this sort of recentering is an ongoing project. It's not a kind of like a, a static thing that happens once and for all, right? So, uh, so theorists like Gugiwati and Go talk about decolonizing rather than decolonization. Um, and, and I know there's a big debate, so people don't wanna talk about decolonization at all. They wanna talk about decoloniality, whatever the point is, it's an ongoing dynamic thing uh, that 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 makes recentering itself uh, uh, protein and the, the dynamic as dynamic as as our kind of uh, intersecting social identities. Um, and so, given that these social identities are ever evolving, then cultivating a positive African identity uh, requires theorizing epistemic decolonization, regardless of how uh, of how you conceive of it. So, so what I want to, to, the moral I want to draw from, from this kind of discussion is, is that in order to avoid the, the, the challenge that theorizing decolonization leaves uh, the African person stuck in defining, stuck in a kind of negative project uh, where the colonizer is very much at the center, um, we need to conceive of, of epistemic decolonization as recentering the knowledge enterprise onto one's uh, geo-socio-political location. Um, so the questions that we ask in that mode, in that frame of mind, uh, are, are questions like, well, what is as much as is judicial? So quasi readers idea of the, of the positive program in terms of exploiting uh, as much as is judicious, the resources of our own indigenous uh, conceptual schemes. Okay, one, one question we want to ask is, well, how much and what is judicious? Um, another question we might want to ask is, in what ways should, should our socio- uh, and geopolitical locations shape our knowledge enterprise. Um, how much of, of, of an authentic positive, uh, uh, a positive African identity lies in, in the totally pre-colonial times versus um, in, in the current times that are kind of entangled with, with uh, colonial thinking and so on. So these are just some examples of, of what theorizing under this cap uh, is going to look like. I'm not gonna answer these questions. Uh, they're, they're, they're rather million dollar questions, all of them, I think. Uh, but these are just some examples. So that's the first, the first moral I want to draw. Think of the epistemic decolonization project uh, as, as, a, as, as a project of recentering, and then you're safe uh, against the first challenge. So the second challenge um, is what I've called uh, politicized knowledge. And remember, that um, uh, the first premise of that argument that, that I gave you says that decolonization of any kind is a political project. And, and then the second premise was that epistemic decolonization is a political project. So, uh, excuse me, so this is what Matulian says that in this sense, everything about decolonization is epistemology. And he says this has uh, somewhat dangerous political consequences, right? Um, uh, sorry, not political consequences, but consequences for the, for the knowledge enterprise in general. So he says this, uh, the danger is not only that politics is prioritized at the expense of epistemological endeavors, uh, but that there's a prioritization of epistemologies that fit with the dominant political program. At the conceptual level, those ideas that don't fit with the dominant political program may be excluded from consideration or may be repressed. Um, and then he also thinks that some defenders of epistemologies might get imprisoned, and persecuted. I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's true. Uh, it makes, I think, the epistemology business more dangerous than it is, but, but let's say that, um, or at least that it's been to me so far. Uh, but let's say that that's true. Um, but the point is that this leads, he says, to a stifling of the growth of knowledge um, and a limiting of possibilities of a fair and unprejudiced exchange of views, opinions, and knowledge to create stronger epistemologies that are representative of truly the best. So that's the challenge of politicizing knowledge. Um, 
And my reply to this uh, is going to be again that it seems true of some, some theorists. I think fewer in this case than even fewer than, than, than um, the, previous, the previous one. Um, for example, de Souza Santos um, in his uh, cognitive empires seems to, to equate truth with political success. So here's what he says about uh, knowledge. Knowledges are to be evaluated and ultimately validated according to their usefulness in maximizing the possibilities of success of the struggles against oppression. So that seems like a kind of pragmatic slash political notion of truth and knowledge um, that would indeed seem to be liable to, to Matulino's challenge. Um, but if the challenge is meant as a kind of general statement of, of the epistemic decolonization debate, uh, it seems to presuppose a kind of clean line between knowledge and politics that, to my mind at least, results in a very naive, not results, but is informed by a very naive picture of knowledge. Um, and in particular, um, knowledge production is already politicized through our social identities. So it's not as though, like, in fact, this is what we're trying to reject here. With, uh, remember what Mignola's rejection of the zero point. Um, that's the whole point. We're trying to throw away this idea where there's a clean line between knowledge and politics, and knowledge is this universal thing that doesn't, um, it doesn't have anything to do with our identities. It's dislocated, disembodied, and so on. So, so knowledge is already uh, politicized to our social identities, and not acknowledging this, in fact, results in marginalizing certain identities. Uh, and hence what, what Christy Dodson calls political injustice, uh, sorry, contributory injustice. Um, and that's the injustice that uh, of, uh, in, in which marginalized uh, epistemic resources, which are developed in order to make sense of marginalized experiences, don't get the desired uptake. And so they, they don't start uh, circulating in the, in the main knowledge economy. Uh, and, and so, and so they, re they remain at the margins. And so they, they don't have uh, the opportunity to, to be used in order to fight oppression and, the, and colonization and so on. So I think that not acknowledging the political dimension of knowledge uh, results in, in various kinds of epistemic injustice. And this is the fourth continent. Uh, so so I'm, I'm done with my four continents now. I think I've done my bit, so I can relax now. So, so uh, on the other hand, it seems like acknowledging this uh, political dimension to knowledge doesn't have the dire consequences that Matulino imagines, right? Um, because it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it simply doesn't follow that we should privilege any particular political interests. Uh, so, for example, and I, I don't know maybe that if there are any political philosophers here, uh, they'll laugh at me. But, but the way I look at it is like is is a kind of distinction between uh, what you might call thin and thick political benefits. So thick political benefits would be benefits that serve particular interests, political interests. So if I'm, you know, a communist, like then, then thick political benefits are those that fall in line with my uh, communist agenda. Uh, but thin political benefits uh, are more kind of justice, basic benefits, such as well, justice itself, well-being, uh, overcoming uh, oppression and marginalization, and so on. So. I mean, it may be that this distinction itself is a bit thick, but anyway, uh, so, so, so this is how I think of it. So I think of it as Matulino's challenge presupposing that uh, uh, knowledge is politicized in the thick sense, uh, whereas I think that uh, theorizers of epistemic decolonization look at the political benefits of, of the politicization of knowledge in terms of these thin uh, political benefits. So I think that moral too uh, uh, of, uh, from, from this discussion is um, to, in order to avoid illegitimate politicization of knowledge, uh, this is moral one, theorize epistemic decolonization as recentering, uh, where the political benefits, and this is moral two, uh, of such recentering, I understood as thin political benefits, such as uh, justice, well-being, empowerment, um, anti-marginalization, whatever. And so then uh, theorizing epistemic decolonization in this cap uh, would not imply that we're going to be using particular uh, resources. So when we're building our, our decolonized epistemology, we're not going to be drawing on, on those indigenous resources that uh, are kind of serving thick interests, uh, but only on those that are serving thin interests. 
Um, and then examples of questions uh, in, in, in this mode of theorizing epistemic decolonization would be, well, is my conception of knowledge marginalizing anyone's uh, epistemic resources? Uh, are my epistemic standards promoting empowerment? Uh, and so on. So, so that's the that's the second uh, challenge, hopefully met. The third challenge, uh, and it's it's actually a bit more layered in this case, uh, is that um, epistemic decolonization theorizing obscures um, the African uh, the African condition or important aspects of the African condition. So here's what Matulino says: um, There's a lack of frankness uh, in epistemic decolonization when it's at odds with Sorry. Uh, in epistemic decolonization, when it's at odds with facts on the ground, where we see countless numbers of Africans leaving their homes to find protection, safety, and fulfillment of their dreams in the former metropoles of colonial admin administration. That departure is the strongest condemnation of the home's dysfunctionality. And what makes the condemnation worse is that the departer is intent on setting home permanently where she's, where she's precisely where she's historically uh, discriminated against. Epistemic decolonization can never tell us anything about this new phenomenon and can never tell, tell us anything uh, about how it can be reversed. So this is uh, powerful stuff. So this sounds like, like a single kind of obscured uh, uh, aspect of, of the African's condition. But when you look at the homes, an expression such as the homes dysfunctionality, uh, things become you know, more complex. So what is dysfunctional uh, about uh, our African home? And, and I'm going to focus on three uh, aspects here that Matulino um, uh, discusses. Um, and the first one is that uh, the African person continues to be disempowered uh, and the second one is that uh, she's complicit in her own condition to a certain extent, and then that we're unprepared for the global world. Um, and I think, I think I'm only probably going to talk about one and three, but let's see how it goes. So the continued disempowerment I already um, uh, mentioned at the beginning when I when I when I told you that. Um, Montalino's purpose is to, to interrogate the relevance uh, of uh, decolonial discourse given the material underdevelopment in stifled political, spa political spaces uh, that render the supposed beneficiaries of decolonization hopeless subjects who continue to be disempowered and oppressed in their own home. Uh, so I mean, what, what do we do about this? Uh, about this kind of challenge? Like, is it true that uh, epistemic decolonization really leaves the very people who, whom it's supposed to benefit uh, continually disempowered. Um, and I think that, so my reply here is going to be two, two, two point. Um, firstly, you, you can't really empower uh, the oppressed without epistemically centering them. And um, we were reading uh, at our reading group at the University of Kent uh, uh, last week, um, Emlon Davis, on, on uh, appropriation, on epistemic appropriation. And she makes a similar point uh, in the context of justifying epistemic uh, uh, injustice theorizing. So, so the, the thought is, the challenge there is, well, look, if we can just eliminate all of the, all of the uh, inequalities and injustices uh, in, in our society, then we won't need this you know, epistemic injustice nonsense. You know, we, we would have fixed it, fixed the society, fix epistemic injustice. And she says, well, actually, uh, any such practice, uh, this is, these are her words, any such practice of, of fixing economic and political disempowerment that's developed without centering the participation of the very people whose lives it prefers to improve risks distorting these lives uh, and, and these people. Um, because epistem removing epistemic barriers that prevent marginalized persons from fully participating in collective efforts to dismantle structures of oppression is imperative if those efforts are to succeed. Uh, insofar as identifying and understanding these epistemic barriers is a necessary precursor to their removal, independent conceptual investigation of such barriers is called for. 
Um, and here's the punchline, while knowing is only half the battle, it's importantly the first half. Right? Uh, so I think that a similar thing can be said in the context uh, of epistemic decolonization, right? Uh, yes, um, we need to empower people, but uh, uh, the first half of this empowerment is to do with knowledge. Um, and, and with centering, epistemically centering, uh, the very people who are supposed to be empowered. Um, and, and of course, and, and this is the second part of my reply, education is key to this empowerment. So, uh, so if, if you recall uh, Linda Smith's uh, great expression of Western knowledge is porridge, right? So like we want to dismantle precisely to, to get, you know, we want caviar, right? Like we don't want Western knowledge anymore. Uh, so that's probably a very colonial way of putting it, but, but, uh, but hopefully you know what I mean. Uh, so uh, so it, this would involve uh, decolonizing epistemic institutions, right? Um, and that would involve kind of thinking of questions like, well, what cur curricula would empower African students? Uh, uh, how should we make academia the sort of space where, where African students feel at home? So here's at the moment what my world looks like, my academic world. This is um, uh, the University of the Witwatersrand in, in, in Johannesburg, kind of, uh, it might you know, remind you of dreams of the, of the Pantheon. Um, here's the University of Cape Town, quietly dreaming uh, of the Parthenon. And in case you think I'm running down the competition, here's my university. Uh, and, and this is, uh, bears a very unfortunate resemblance to the lagers in which the Boers used to uh, take over uh, African, uh, so they used to defend their families within these lagers uh, while they were taking off over African land. So you can imagine uh, how, how an African student feels in these kinds of environments. And so then the point is that part of the empowerment uh, of, of the African person involves, well, first of all, dismantling these spaces, of course, uh, but, but building the kind of space in which, in which uh, education is, is, is a key to to empowerment, right? Um, so that's so that's my reply um, to uh, this uh, to this challenge. Um, presumably, we can't do any of this stuff, right, without actually thinking about what it takes to do this stuff, and that just is theorizing uh, epistemic decolonization. So I think that this uh, this discussion um, uh, leads to really re-emphasizing moral two. Um, um, so if you recall, Moro One said theorize epistemic uh, decolonization as a recentering project, uh, where the political benefits of such recentering are understood as, as thin political benefits. So things like justice, empowerment, and well-being. Um, so, so that's so that's going to be, uh, I think, the, the, the answer to um, to how we fix the first condition that's being, the first aspect of, of the African condition that's being obscured. Um, I think in the interest, uh, Andreas, you said I have 45 minutes, right? Okay. Yes, yeah, about 45 minutes. Okay, let me skip this, this one then. Um, so we do miss an important moral, but uh, I, I wasn't, it was the moral that I was least sure about, so that's all right. Okay, so, so then um, the, the, the second aspect of the um, African condition that uh, Matulino thinks we are obscuring when, when we theorize epistemic decolonization is a kind of lack of preparedness for, uh, for living in a global world. And here's how he puts it. Um, decolonization is a limited approach to both understanding and transforming life on the continent. Thinking of decolonization as a primary factor of our, uh, of our station necessarily involves abdicating other responsibilities we might have towards our situation. Excuse me, such responsibilities might include thinking about pressing questions of the day that are not of a colonial nature. For example, the colonial thought is not likely to be well equipped to take us far when we start thinking of the modern world's crises, such as global warming, shared and common threats to all of humanity as well as opportunities that await Africans if they were to be meaningfully connected to the rest of the world. So, so my reply to this, to this uh, part of the uh, obscured African condition challenge is that, yes, of course, epistemic decolonization uh, theorizing is limited 
but it wasn't meant to be a, a fix for all, all the world's problems. Um, but the, the ones that Matulino does mention here, I think, uh, can be fixed. And, and, uh, and the first thing to note is that the kind of clean line that he draws between uh, colonialism, or that's presupposed on this critique, between colonialism and global crises is actually implausible. So uh, the, the, the connections between uh, our, our environment and crisis and capitalism on the one hand and capitalism and colonialism on the other hand uh, are very well documented. So, so I think there isn't that kind of clear uh, line that he draws between um, uh, de decolonization, uh, sorry, colonialism and, uh, uh, and global crises. But more positively, uh, I think that thinking of epistemic decolonization as recentering can help us a lot, right, with, with these crises. So, for example, we can tap into African indigenous resources for con conservation. Um, and um, likewise, thinking of, of uh, epistemic decolonization as globalizing uh, knowledge from Africa is part of laying the foundation for these sorts of meaning meaningful connections to the world. Uh, that that Matulino laments uh, we are not laying the foundations for. And if you remember, this was when I when I when I um, spelled out what we mean by, uh, or some people mean by recentering. Uh, I cited Global Guccini, who says that it's not just an intellectual process of centering Africa as a legitimate epistemic authority, but it's also uh, as uh, as a center of globalizing knowledge from Africa. And so I think the moral, what was going to be moral four, but now is moral three, is that when you theorize uh, epi epistemic decolonization, you need to think of the recentering, the epistemic recentering of all, as constrained by the usefulness uh, of indigenous resources for thriving in a global world. So um, you can you can be asking questions like, well, which of those can help us with current global crises, which can be globalized to the rest of the world. Uh, which can meaningfully connect us with the rest of the world, and so on. So um, I think if these thoughts are on the right track, um, then, then the sort of conception of epistemic decolonization that emerges should have three now uh, sort of constraints. So uh, when, when you theorize epistemic decolonization, you need to think of it as a, a kind of recentering of the knowledge enterprise to Africa. Um, and that involves recentering it around our intellectual interests and our intellectual needs, not the West, the, the global North, whatever. Um, whose political benefits, a kind of recentering that, whose political benefits are understood as, as what I call thin, so they aim at justice and empowerment and well being uh, rather than a particular substantive political interests. And we're going to skip this one. Uh, the third one, and then go straight for the fourth one, where the recentering in question is constrained by the usefulness uh, of indigenous resources for thriving in a global world. And I think if you if you have this kind of conception of epistemic decolonization, then you would be immune to Matulino's challenges, uh, and we can carry on running these series uh, and happily theorizing epistemic decolonization. Thank you very much.